I have to be honest with you, Emily. The biggest R I feel is ready to do the podcast with you. Oh, stop it. That was really bad. I couldn't blush. I couldn't think of a good line to do. Because what even is it? It's like, what's the R you feel? Uh, regret or... Relief. Relief or... Yeah, yeah. No, I was trying to think of a fun R word, but I'm like, what's like a... What's a word that means like I'm jazzed, but it starts with R? Like, I'm feeling ready for a rendezvous. Like, what? Um, but yes, we're doing the podcast. It's our podcast, and it's The Swamp, which is an acronym. It stands for some whack-ass movie podcasting. And my name is Dara, and as always, here I'm here with my lovely co-host, Emily, and um, we're doing sequel September. Like, I, I promised that we are ramping up, and we are covering Kill Bill Volume 2, which I would argue is, like, less of a sequel and more of, like, a delayed... Continuation. I mean, yeah, it, it it is a sequel. Like, it is a sequel, and we are, you know, Technically. considering it to be a sequel for... But it is not, like, it's not Kill Bill 2. It's no. Volume 2. Volume 2. And I, I very much do consider these two movies to be just, like, a one piece of media. Like, yeah. you have to watch one and two together. It's not like a... It's not even like a, oh, wait, which one do you like better, one or two? Like, no, that's... I'm not picking. It's, it's one movie. Yeah. That they just happen to have to release in two parts, because... Have you ever watched these simultaneously, like, back to back? Because I never have. Oh, yeah, I do all the time. Like, it's always, like... Yeah, really? almost every mm. time I watch one, I just immediately, I'm like, oh, I have to watch two now. Or, like, even watching, mm. them, like, volume two for this podcast, I was like, damn, I kind of want to, like, start and watch volume one first to, like, get into the, the mm-hmm. zone, but I, I didn't. Um, but, yeah, we're doing sequel September, uh, Kill Bill volume two. Yeah, that's it. That's my intro. That's my intro to the podcast. <laughs> um, and if you want, wanna, I would say go back and definitely listen to our volume one Um Absolutely. Because they are very much like, and I, I do know we addressed a lot of things in our volume one episode that I don't want to be like super repetitive and just talk about again in this one. But the issues of like the abuse that happened on set, obviously Harvey Weinstein was like heavily involved in production. He's a shit bag. Quentin Tarantino is also a shit bag. A little less so, but like still a shit bag. Um, so, yeah. and obviously Uma Thurman and the car accident and sort of the neglect that happened there is something that we talked a fair amount about on our Mm -hmm. volume one episode. So I just wanted to like, I'm not trying to glaze over it, but I just don't want to give the same Mm -hmm. like uh, speech again, but I will again, link in the description, the uh, New York times article that she wrote kind of uh, disclosing all of what had happened. And it's a great read as far as like an insight to like the actual like shitty onset stuff that happens to uh, actresses in Hollywood specifically, just like her experience with this movie um, in particular. Mm-hmm. So I'll put that in the description below. But again, I just didn't want to like harp on the same shit again because we did talk about it last time because it, it felt you know important to address. But it is more prevalent in Volume Two because it's like this is the the scene where she's driving the car. Like this is where it actually yeah. happens. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, just wanted to get that out of the way because y'all don't want to listen to the same episode twice. If you're listening to volume two, I'm going to assume that you should go back and listen to our volume one uh, episode, which we did for Seek, or uh, we did for uh, Banger Soundtrack Month. Soundtrack. Which, again, I'm not going to try to, like, harp on how fucking awesome the soundtrack to this movie is, but, like, it is. Like, it's... It's so good. As much as I, th- I don't know if it, which one it was, but I and I definitely said this in the last movie. Um, like I'm really into soundtracks. If you're watching this, which sometimes we post our uh, podcast online, um, we'll put it up on YouTube and everything like that. But I have like a handful of soundtracks you can see behind me on my wall. Big soundtrack guy. There's Dirty Dancing. Um, but this is the movie that like really got me into like soundtracks. Um, and I forget. Oh God, I forget the name. Um, Stephanie, I don't know if it's Stephanie Ramos, I think is her last name. Um, she's the music supervisor for, like, this movie and, like, the first movie and a lot of Quentin Tarantino movies. And it is just absolutely insane. These soundtracks go so hard. Um, I definitely own, like, volume one because I think that one's the better one. But, like, then I listen to this one and I'm like, shit. Well, shit. Yeah, <laughs> it's so good. Um, but this, the music on this, I think, is, like, its own character, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it definitely, uh, there are so many things about this movie that, like, if you took them away, it would be so much less of a film. Like, the, the music, 
particularly. I love the, the breaking up of it by chapters. Like, just so many decisions mm-hmm. that were made that I'm like, fundamentally, if you just do, like, a revenge movie, it's just like, that might not be that good. But, yeah, I guess if we want to get into a little bit of a recap as far as volume one, very quickly, it's just um, Uma Thurman's character, the bride, as we know her, or also Black Mamba. Um, she is on sort of a rampage of revenge because she was, um, they tried to, a group of assassins that she was formerly a member of tried to kill her. They put her in a coma and she was pregnant and then she thought she lost the baby. Um, and so she's going through and she's killing all of these assassins who are all, um, under the supervision, leadership, direction i don't know of this man named bill and so that's sort of movie one is she goes through and she you know she gets a couple of them and then obviously this volume two is a continuation of um her doing this revenge rampage and it starts off with we got a little bit of background about her wedding and what she was doing she adopted a new like a pseudonym and she was just gonna live a life of you know, sort of simplicity. She was going to leave because she was an assassin. She was going to leave it all behind. But then Bill obviously finds her and is like, is this really what you're going to do? Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, you're an assassin. She's like, well, you know, this baby, I want to, you know, let it have a normal assassin-free life. Um, but then that's when the, you know, the group of, what are they called? The, the snake gang? <laughs> um, oh, God. Why can't I think of the name of them now? Um... The Deadly Vipers assass- Assassin's something. Assassin's... I like Snake Gang. <laughs> it's not the a club. The slithery little <laughs> snaky snakes um, are coming to... They shoot her in the head, and obviously she's presumed dead, but then she ends up in a coma. Um, mm-hmm. But then we see... What's the first one? We then... Uh, we get to Bud, right? Bud is Bill's brother. Bud. And Bill goes to Bud and is basically like, she's going to come for your ass. Like, she's going to come and wreck your shit and you should let me protect you. And he's like, fuck off. She deserves to kill me because of everything we, you know. He's kind of a real one for that. Right? So true. I feel like he has the best attitude out of all the deadly vipers. Mm-hmm. He's kind of like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, say love Like, I should die. Fair enough. He's like, yeah, if she gets, she, he's like... If she gets me, she gets me, but I'm not going to go down without a fight. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Which she then goes to his trailer and he blasts her with rock salt and then uh, uh, basically sedates her and buries her alive. And I don't know why you would not just double tap this bitch. Like, make sure it, you want her to suffer. You can make her suffer in a way that you ensure that she is deceased, you know? Right. Burying, like, you should not have underestimated that she was not going to weasel her way out of this because we then get a flashback of her training, her basic, like, her, like, super mega assassin training with Pai Mei, who's this, like, ultra, I don't know, fighting guru coach guy um, who all of the deadly vipers go to, or at least just both Beatrix and Elle went to Pai Mei. Yeah. Um, and Bill has some sort of pull connection i think bill also yeah. trained under pine trained because, under him um, yeah. but basically we learn that she can punch through a board with only three inches of space and pine ensured that that was a skill that she had and boy oh boy is it coming in handy when you have to break out of a coffin and so then she successfully <laughs> does so um and she then goes and uh l who is going to buy her sword off of bud from, yeah, her Hattori Hanzo sword. Um, L kills Bud using a black mamba, which, use your own snake. Nah. I, well, I mean, I don't... What snake was she is the whole thing. Not Copperhead. I don't fucking know. Um, if your snake isn't but, cool enough for you to... Like, why are you using your, like, mortal enemy's snake as so a Like weapon? she said... Like she said, she was like, she deserved a better death, you stupid bastard. I guess. But to me, I'm just like, okay, that seems a little, like, step up your prop game to be more on brand with you. Uh, I don't know. I, I like what she did. It was like a, a subtle yeah. nod. Like, it, it, she was like, if Beatrix is dead, I might as well let her snake at him. You know what I mean? Fair. fair. Yeah, which but- I, that's one thing I... That's one thing I like about their dynamic is that, like, even though they fucking hate each other, they definitely respect each other. Mm-hmm. 
So, but anyways. Um, <clears throat> but so, yeah, so she releases the snake, and the snake gets Bud, and then that's when Beatrix shows up and is basically like, hey, Elle, I'm here to fuck, <laughs> Surprise! Your, here to fuck your shit up, and they have a fight, and they both, uh, turns out Bud did not pawn his Satori Hanzo sword, it was in his golf bag the whole time, so they have a sword fight battle, um, and then basically she snatches Elle's other eyeball, and then squishes it with her bare toes, which is just such a gratuitously Quentin Tarantino dirty foot Ugh. squishing an eyeball shot. Literally so gross. Um, but she gets her, and then she goes, and she finally gets Bill, but it turns out Bill has had her baby this whole time, that the baby didn't die when she was in a coma. The baby was fine, and Bill has been raising BB, her baby, um, and she's like, oh, shit, like, this is really screwing, putting a wrench in my plans. And so they kind of play house for a bit. But then once so, BB's in bed, they are like, oh, so we are going to fight to the death now, huh? And they're like, yeah, that's the plan. Like, like that's how it's going to have to be. And they basically, he shoots her with truth serum, which. So weird. <laughs> Where'd okay. that come from? And originally their plan is like, we're going to have a sword fight to the death. Um, and then they sort of are really dancing around, you know, how it's going to migrate to that point. But then they're both sitting down and he tries to lunch for her. And then Beatrix goes, do, 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 and does the five point point palm exploding heart technique, which is so fire. And it turns out that Pai Mei did not teach anyone that except for Beatrix because she was the best student. Um, and it's, you know, pretty poetic to, ha like, kill the person you love the most by literally making their heart explode. Um, so yeah. Bill takes the five steps, and his heart explodes, and she scoops up BB, and they ride off into the sunset, and that yeah. is volume two. Sorry, that was a really long-winded... Uh, it's all right. She said, bitch, I'm a mother! <laughs> <laughs> um, but to me, it is always so interesting, the, the like, assassin-to-mother dynamic we get, especially in the second movie, because I think the first movie is really establishing her as, like, a badass assassin, like, the fight scene, especially with the crazy idiots mm -hmm. and her and Oren and their sort of duel. We get that, and then this movie is way more about giving the backstory and establishing her as, like, a sympathetic mm -hmm. protagonist and yeah. having us be more on her side, not just because she's a badass, but because she also is, like worthy of getting revenge against all these people and it's way more yeah. dialogue heavy than like action heavy like there's yeah. hardly really any like fight i mean there are fight scenes but they're way less dramatic and choreographed than the fight scene we get in movie one mm -hmm. which is a good oh, yeah. you know if, if there was going to be another big grand thing it would have just kind of felt drawn out and tired so i kind of like yeah. it's just them in the trailer like busting through the walls and snapping yeah oh i'm not I think it's probably one of my favorite fight scenes in this one. Like, as, as amazing and spectacular. Which, honestly, if I went back and watched volume one right now, I'd say, oh, no, that's my favorite fight scene. It's, like, the same way that, like, whenever I see, like, a, a Ghibli movie, I'm like, that's my new favorite. Yeah. You know what I mean? I always flip-flop. Um, but I think that one's my favorite fight scene. At least, like, right now it is. Um, because, like, I don't know, man. It's just funny. You know what I mean? Which is, like, hard to do. Um, <clears throat> it's funny and it's a little gross because... Yeah, like, it's so well choreographed and just so entertaining throughout the whole thing. But, like, for, like, the first, like, five minutes of it, like, when they're just battling for, like, the one sword, basically, before Bud Sword comes into play, the whole entire thing is, like... It's a cat fight. It's entirely a cat fight. No one can open the sword because the trailer is too small. Beatrix is, like, giving Elle, like, a fucking swirly-whirly with her head in the fucking toilet and everything like that. Like, it's hysterical. Like, the way that they're throwing each other through the walls is so funny. <laughs> Which is, like... That's this whole movie. Like, I think this movie is funny. Yeah, when you, you texted me about when Bud um, blasts her with the rock salt and she goes flying back, like, 40 <laughs> feet. It, it's just, like, it's so overdramatic that it's funny, but not to the point where I'm annoyed by it. Like, like Pai Mei, yeah. that whole sequence, too. Like, him flipping his little beard and, like, being a little drama queen. It's, it's so oh my fucking God. funny. He, and, it, like, it could get so really con. annoying. It, oh, it could get annoying, but it is, it's like, serve. 
serve. Serve. Those eyebrows? Oh my god. Slay. <laughs> no, for real. I like, there's like a couple of times in this movie, like, I'll rewind like 10 seconds because I'm like, I want to see that again. And her getting shot like through the door is like one of those ones. But like, also, imagine like, <laughs> like imagine effectively getting your nipples blown off. <laughs> <laughs> I also like that's one thing I was thinking about this time because I'm sitting there I'm like looking at like all the giant blood stains on her chest and I'm sitting there I'm like no fucking way her nipples did not survive that <laughs> she's got like half of one left at that point like if we're being real about it uh, yeah I I don't <laughs> understand the dynamics of like guns or like you know projectiles because I feel like if you shot somebody with rock salt at that close of a range and it still penetrated, you're still dead it still penetrated her skin enough to have her be like gushing blood I'm like how is she not fucking deceased like that well and I'm like makes it's no sense it's like the same exact idea as like a shotgun basically you know what I mean because a shotgun just sprays I it's like it's not bullets it's shrapnel I don't know I don't do I look like a person that plays with guns I, no, I don't know my shit, but, like, this is from, like, the li- very limited knowledge I know. Um, but, like, rock salt is, like, effectively, like, the same thing. You know what I mean? As, as like, a rock. That would be, like, oh, yeah. instead of bullets, yeah. we're using rocks. Like, what's the difference? I don't I don't know. Um, but that scene is so funny. And then I also think it's just so... I love the set design of the trailer. Because when they're, doing, so good. When they're doing that little fight and it is so, like, we can't get the sword open because it's so little and we're just pushing each other into, like, flimsy walls that are falling down, uh-huh. they use the, like, shitty, gross man living by himself in a dirty trailer uh-huh. to the full extent. Because when she dumps the, the can of dip, the spit cup... Like yeah, he's been he's been doing like dip because at one point he spits on spits Beatrice. in her eyes. He yeah. spits on her face, and she has the dip on her face. And then when her and Elle are having their fight, she takes the dip and she, and it's all over her, and and she then wipes it. and She goes gross, and I'm like choking back vomit because it's that disgusting. is so nasty. That is so nasty. But I, it's yeah. those little details of like uh-huh. a hick backwards cowboy who's living you know in a trailer is gonna have a big old thing a dip and like in that moment yeah. what do you do <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah no i love seeing like all the props they end up fighting with it's like the tv antenna and like the guitar and everything like that mm-hmm. um it's so fun and it's so funny um and i love the little um the sound effects that go along with it it's like the like it, like literally like the clips the sounds you'll get like from garage band of like guitar smashing and it's exactly like the sound you're thinking of my favorite my favorite so the sound effects in this movie are so incredible and i don't think i really appreciated that until i got into like production cuz i um mm-hmm. worked in advertising for a hot minute and like finding as you know, the lowest person on the totem pole. They're like, oh, find royalty-free sound effects for, like, cat litter crunching. Because we're selling cat litter. And you sit there and you're like, hmm, this one's a little too crunchy. Next, you know? And so going yeah. through and, like, li- like finding sound effects, I fucking love how extra they are when Paime flips his beard and it's like, swish, swish. <laughs> Every sound effect I they love- use is, like, the most dramatic one they could possibly find. And it's perfect. There's one that makes me giggle so much, and it is with, like, her, and she's fighting Pai Mei, and he's just, like, shoved her up against a tree, and he's like, fight me, bitch, or whatever, and he's like, yeah, he's, like, swooshing his beard or whatever, and she goes, and she just flips her ponytail, like, six different times. It's, oh my god, it makes me crack up. It's it's so funny. And I don't um, know if they, if it's as heavy-handed in volume one. It might be a little bit, but nowhere near as much, I think. Volume two yeah. is really like, oh, we're just doing the, the soundboard. Let's up the ante. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, no, it's, it's so good. I love it. Um, but I, while I was watching this, I, and... Since it is my favorite fight, I was sitting there, I was like, girlfriend's idea, Halloween costume, you and your girlfriend, Elle and Beatrix during that fight scene, please, but please I someone think- do that for me. You, you, I know there's two of you little blonde bitches out there that look like sisters who are dating, and I, I'm going to have to see you in this costume. I feel like I personally think that 
from the first movie though if you do because her in the tracksuit is the most iconic look because yeah. what if you do them it's like somebody in an eye patch and then somebody covered in dirt that's <laughs> dirt. Cool that if you do movie one l in the nurse outfit is a little more halloween the eye patch in the little nurse outfit yeah. and then beatrix in the, the cat suit even though that's not like from the fight i still think yeah. that if you wanted to do that especially if you're in kind of like a like a toxic uh, not to <laughs> Don't 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 do yeah, that if your relation if your relationship sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but um something I love about this is Uma Thurman and Daryl Hannah fucking hated each other. Like to the point Interesting. To the point where the people on set, like the production assistants on set, had to keep them apart and were specifically requested to have them like leave their hotels in like, you know, spaced out chunks so that they didn't like end up in the elevator together oh or like God. didn't end up at the yeah that's how much they fucking hated each other it's like on the press tour they were never in the same interview like nothing because that's how much they did not like huh. each other so i think that that adds to that, you know that that so definitely there's a little like comes through yeah, there's a little weight behind that fight mm-hmm. huh i also huh. always um i always forget that she's married to neil young <laughs> Isn't what? That so fu- Isn't that so funny? Yeah, Daryl Hannah L is uh, married to to Neil Young. <laughs> oh my god, I had no idea. It's like love that for you, girly. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I just want to say this really quick because, um, and I don't think anyone else here is gonna get this. Um, not anyone. Some of you are gonna get it. Some of you aren't. But this is purely for me and Dara right now. Um, there's, okay, so there's one part in, like, the training montage, basically, where she's, like, with Pai Mei, like, they've gone through and he's like, fine, I'll train you, you stupid whore. She's like, okay. Um, and there's, like, this big montage of him, like, training her, basically, and intercut with that is, like, part of it where she's, like, doing a form and rocking through these different moves or whatever, and it goes, and it's like, and it's got all the sound effects and everything like that, and it just gives such... Chris Fleming energy and Chris Fleming vibe. It's insane. I'm like, that's Chris I Fleming. I wrote that down. Shut up. I, I literally had that written down. So Chris Fleming, uh, you know, doesn't need our promotion, but I feel like if you enjoy sort of our sense of humor, you would love Chris Fleming. I think is my favorite comedian. I can't. He formed he us. Does, but, yeah. It's- he formed us as like very young people. Cause I remember you showed me Gail when we were like 14 years old so, and we watched all of it. Yeah. So he used to do this YouTube series called Gail Waters Waters, where he like pretended to be like a suburban mom, but he just like is a man in a headband. I don't know. And, <laughs> but has since gone on. Obviously he does like stand up specials that we've uh, gone and seen live and all of that. And just comes up with these like hilariously like irreverent and slurs, like stupidly absurd comedic video things but go check out Chris Fleming because but also the way that he like utilizes his lanky body a lot to like Like I think the I think a good one to watch for that would be like the grad student shuffle would be a good one where he like dances a lot Mm -hmm. or um foopy the (laughs) do you know what I'm talking about but either of those I feel like you really get to see Chris Fleming in like their full I don't know lanky glory but it was so I it, I it would, was giving. Uh, I would pay so much money to see that, like, you just remake this entire movie, but it's Chris Fleming as Beatrix. That would be iconic. Um, <laughs> yeah, cause, but that, you know, Chris Fleming reference aside, that, like, whole sequence is kind of funny because she does not look graceful. Like, no. she, she's doing these, like, hand movements, like, half voguing, half, <laughs> like, karate. I don't even know, but it, it it is, I like the cinematography of, um, it's mm-hmm. like the, their silhouettes sort of together. Yeah. Like, interspliced with her training. It's almost like a music video to me. It looks yeah. Very, like It that. is very music video. Mm-hmm. Which I, I really liked. Um, but it, I also love the the reference of, like, we're gonna do this whole back, you know, um, flashback narrative thing just to prove that she is able to to punch through the board oh, yeah. at three inches. They're it's like, a, we're gonna do an entire 20-minute It's like a 25-minute... Just minute. to justify. 
It's yeah. the middle. It's the third. It's the second act. Like, it's the, the middle chunk of the movie. They're like, just to uh-huh. justify that she can do this shit, let's just, let's take a step back and let's really uh-huh. make sure that this is, you know, grounded in reality, which I think is such a Tarantino, like, it doesn't matter how you get from point A to point B because it's going to take, like, mm-hmm. 80,000 side turns, but it's, like, gr- so much more gratifying because it took so long. Because mm-hmm. the whole point of this movie to get, you know, from the beginning to her end goal realistically could have taken her it could it could have happened in like 15 minutes right this could have been hey this could have been one of your 90 minute movies uh no this this is one that i so it was supposed to be one film and they did all of this and they're like dude the director's cut is five and a half hours long like how are you gonna do it and he was very like i don't want to cut any of this because truthfully how would you how would how would you have made this from the very beginning all the way up to her killing bill and still getting the the killing of every assassin member in in even a you know even a two and a half hour movie like no fucking shot I don't understand mm-hmm. but um basically then they were like okay well if you're not gonna cut it down like we're gonna split it into two which I'm grateful that they did because like ha- like literally how would this have been I don't understand yeah. um but you can watch the whole thing there is like a version um, mm-hmm. that you can just like it's just the whole thing like compiled together. Love but it that. is, um, yeah, very much. I I feel this way pretty strongly about a lot of um, things I see now of like movies that feel really rushed and that the pacing is really bad or just weird mm. to me. That I'm like, you know, you can make a mini series, like the that the you know the six to ten episode TV mini series is now mm-hmm. such a respected art form. It's not like you are sacrificing your like feature film status to like so- some things i'm just like you just cannot justifiably make that into a less than a three hour movie make a fucking mini series make it one hour each six episodes and tell your story the way that it is it's meant you know, to be told it needs to be right? told i don't know i just get so annoyed sometimes mm-hmm. because i'll be watching a movie and i'm like like why are you sacrificing good stuff for yeah. that you want it to be a movie like who fucking cares i don't know i just Doesn't matter. so many things i'm like oh this just could have been a miniseries and it would have been yeah. so much better um and then there's certainly some Entirely. miniseries that i'm like yeah this this could have this, this could have been, been a movie yeah this could have been a movie do all that yeah but yeah um, I, I, I'm glad that they did end up splitting it up and having it be a volume one and volume mm-hmm. two rather than just one movie or, you know, whatever else could have come yeah. out of it. Um, I, I kind of like the way that, um, it splits up. I don't know how to put this. Um, she kind of feels, uh, Uma Thurman kind of feels like a different actor in this one. And I think it's just because like, she has a lot more to work with dialogue wise and like storyline wise and everything like that. Um, because as amazing as the first movie is, it's a lot of action, like, back to back to back. There's not really much for her to, like, work with, really, um, in terms of, like, getting, like, really, like, I don't know, into the character. It's just kind of like, she's a hard ass, or whatever, or she can be, or she can be charming, you know what I mean? Um, or she's killing people and everything like that. And so, like, when I, of course, like, whenever people say, like, which is your favorite, you can't really choose. But, like, I always found myself, more so when I was younger, I think now I appreciate the first movie a lot more. Um, but always when I was younger, being, like, gra- gravitating more towards the second movie. Because I think it just has a lot of more levels to it. And I like seeing how good of an actress she is. Because she is stunning. She's absolutely stunning. Because I don't think that Tarantino utilizes her, like that much like I think back to like Pulp Fiction and everything like that which like she's a good actress and everything like that but she's kind of like I I don't want to reduce her down to like eye candy because it's not just that but like it's like it's not like the most crazy complex character and everything like that and you don't get those levels like when you watch the first movie but like I really like seeing like how much like work she can do in this movie and like seeing her like um actually like interacting with Bill and like their back and forth when they were younger and everything like that and like her actually I always like found like that scene when she actually first sees BB for the first time to be just really great heartbreaking. and just heart yeah. yeah heartbreaking and heart stopping and everything like that and like as much as like the truth serum part of it like kind of like is like eh, what's this like still I love seeing her acting and her like fighting it and everything like that 
Which, like, mind you, like, acting's not just, like, screaming and crying and everything like that. But, like, you can tell there's, like, layers there. And it's it's just phenomenal. Uma Thurman is an amazing actress. I have nothing but praise for her. I think she's one of my favorites ever. Back at it again. I'm starting this segment the same way I always do in this tone of voice and by saying... Back at it again with another intro and podcast segment, Chocolate or Vanilla, hosted by my lovely mother, Jen. Here she is. She comes down. It's a game. She says two things we all say, which one we like better. Jen, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? I'm fine. I'm having a great morning. We're podcasting in the morning, which is unusual for us. Usually we're much later at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, yeah. A, we're a nighttime crew, but yeah. sometimes doing it first thing in the morning, it's like I've had my coffee. It's refreshing. I'm feeling energized. Mm-hmm. So I'm cho- on my second cup of coffee. Yeah, chocolate or vanilla, first thing in the morning, you know? I'm ready for it. All right. Um, so we, we have a theme. We have a sequel theme. And mm-hmm. um, last time it was Quentin Tarantino movies, so this time it's Quentin Tarantino actors versus people who I don't believe have ever been in a Quentin Tarantino movie. Okay, so Quentin Tarantino people versus non-Quentin Tarantino people. Yes. Okay. Awesome. I like okay. this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Vanilla. Chocolate. Um, John Travolta or Paul Dano? Paul Dano. I love John Travolta. And like, as far as an iconic... You know, person throughout all of everything. It's probably John Travolta takes the cake, but to me, I'm a Paul Dano girl, so I have to say Paul Dano. Mmm, this is tough. This is really tough. I, I wanted to try to make it tough. Your big sigh. <laughs> um, John Travolta mainly holds a place in my heart as Edna Turnblad from Hairspray. I don't care about any Tarantino movie he's been in. Couldn't care less. But him in that fat suit and that wig just changes like my molecular structure every time i see it um <laughs> yeah and it is very much like uh john travolta could have done swiss army man but paul dano could never have done edna turn no yeah so for i think for that reason i'm gonna go uh john travolta all right yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go john travolta also um, next one is samuel l jackson or Rafe fines oh i guess i'm gonna say how do you say? I always I used to call him like Ralph Phineas, and then I think it was oh, Emily someone. who were like, "You dumb bitch, that is not." But honestly, yeah, it's, that's just how it phonetically looks. I'm I'm sorry, but um, yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say what Ray finds is that how yeah. you say it? Ray, that, I'm gonna uh, pick him. Yeah, Rafe. Ralph Phineas, not not that. But, um, yeah, <laughs> that I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick human. him. Because I do, I, I like Samuel L. Jackson, but I do lose a little bit of respect of just, like, him showing up in every Marvel movie and being like, you're a part of a larger universe, and just saying, like, that every single time. I'm like, come on, like, let's move on from that. Yeah, he's just cashing in the checks at this point. Um, I'm also going to agree with you and say Ray Fiennes on this one. Something about just, like, Grand Budapest Hotel, and I really want to see that new one. I forget what it's called, like, The Menu or something like that, with him and <gasps> yes. Anya Taylor-Joy and Nicholas Holt looks really good, so. Ooh, that sounds like a good cast. Yes, it's re- um, that's yeah. one of the ones that, like, just did the, like, the festival circuit mm-hmm. that's been getting, like, good feedback that I'm pretty pumped about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I- I'm gonna say Samuel L. Jackson, though. Um, <clears throat> Uma Thurman or Aubrey Plaza? <sighs> Uma Thurman. Uh, I love, I do love Aubrey Plaza, but I, I, I think as far as like icon legend status, Uma is, she is, uh, you know, on God status to yeah. me. So. Yeah. Kind of shocked you didn't pin her up against her own daughter for this one, Jen. <laughs> her own, but she, Maya Hawk has been in a Quentin Tarantino movie. She was an extra in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That, so. Yeah, no, that's true. Off, that correct. would have been off theme. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're right. You're right. You got me there. Um, yeah, of course I'm gonna go with Uma Thurman. I am obsessed with her. She lives on my wall. She watches me sleep every night in her Kill Bill uniform. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uma, Uma for the sweep, definitely. Um, next one, Bruce Willis or T.J. Lavin. What? <laughs> 
So this is a pretty niche reference. Jen and I, in our household, we watched pretty trashy reality TV, one of which being uh, The Challenge on MTV, hosted by ex-BMX biker TJ Lavin. And who who is he against? Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis versus TJ Lavin. Uh, honestly, as far as like pre- prevalence in my life, I think I consume more TJ Lavin than Bruce Willis. So I'll pick, I'll go for TJ. That's fair. That's fair. I'm going to have to go Bruce Willis on this one because I don't know who that other man is. (laughs) (laughs) I do not know this man. He could be walking down the street street. and I would not know a thing. (laughs) I'm going to take TJ. Um, So the next one is, uh, I forgot to say chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry. Chocolate. Uh, I'll stick vanilla. Yeah, I'll stick with chocolate. Um, And so I got two... Tarantino actors versus a non. Tim Roth versus Rizza versus Sam Rockwell. So I don't know if Rizza has been in a Tarantino movie, but he As did the music, music yeah. for. Um, and who is this first guy? Oh, Tim Roth is. Uh, you're gonna know him as soon as you see him. He's he was in a lot of Tarantino movies, including Reservoir Dogs. I mean, I don't know him, so I'm not gonna pick him. Oh, he's the guy. Yeah, he's that guy. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to pick Riza, uh, you know, mm. out of those three because I do, I like that you threw in, uh, you know, sort of a, a wild card as far as not a physical presence, but a emotional presence. Um, What was my last option? Um, Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell. I do like Sam Rockwell a lot, so I'll go with Sam Rockwell. Yeah, me too. I'm going to go with Sam Rockwell. I put these three against each other because they were all in Mr. Right, which is... <laughs> <laughs> which was a rom-com with Sam Rockwell and Anna Kendrick in it that I think is really funny and no one else does think is really funny. Rizza was it? Yeah, Rizza was in it and he was really good. Oh, that's... <laughs> he has a, a more than a small part. Interesting. And, and that's funny because you've made me watch that movie before and I could not recall a single detail other than that Anna Kendrick wears cat ears the whole time and that really rubbed me the wrong he was, way. He was Steve, the guy with the shotgun. Sure. Yeah, anyway, all right. <laughs> Uh, next one Harvey Keitel versus Sir Paul McCartney okay well, I, <laughs> Why? Yeah, I know this Why? is tough this is tough for Emily but this is not tough for me <laughs> I'm saying Harvey Keitel what so <laughs> So, so M is speechless. No, I'm just confused <laughs> as to where you pulled Paul McCartney from. Because just no affiliation, no Tarantino affiliation. He's never been in a Tarantino movie, and I knew you would have trouble choosing between the two. Oh, so you just you just <laughs> threw this one in to fuck with me? I'm just messing with you. <laughs> All right, John, I see you. Um, <laughs> well, because like from the point of view that I'm like doing this is like b- by actors. You know what I mean? Like Paul McCartney has been in his own movies as a Beatle, and he's also been in one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, I think. <laughs> Other than that, I have no idea. Um, so, as much as I love uh, Sir Paul, I'm going to choose Harvey Keitel on this one. Oh. Um, I am going to go with Paul McCartney. <laughs> um, that was so- a pointed attack. Dad. Yeah, right, really. Here comes the next point. <laughs> Here that's like the next that, hold on. That, that's like when uh, when you yeah. play like Never Have I Ever and like you know like there's one like odd thing that someone's done yeah. instead and you're like Never Have I Ever like burnt down my house or some shit like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> you're like Never Have I Ever had sex on this table last night. And what? Like, yeah. <laughs> Jen, Jen, what kind of Never Have I Ever games are you playing? And everyone's Jesus. like, oh, no, she's so right. She's so right. The two people drink and you're like, uh-huh, it was you two. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, what's all right, the right, next one? So, next one, Steve Buscemi or Tom Holland? <laughs> okay, Jen, you think that this is a pointed attack, but it, there's no even contest here. I recently had a conversation with a coworker when they were like, I have kind of an funny. unconventional celebrity. I have a kind of an unconventional celebrity crush. Like I, you know, it's it's kind of embarrassing. And I was like, oh yeah, me too. I'm obsessed with Steve Buscemi. And not really, they were like, oh no, mine is like that guy from The Bear. What's his name? Jeremy Allen White, White yeah. or whatever. 
Yeah, they're like, I, who is a very conventionally attractive, age-appropriate man. And I'm like, oh, no, I do want to fuck Steve Buscemi. Yeah, and I will say it with my chest. Uh, so, no, your unconventional Adam Driver as your unconventional crush, fuck you. He just has a big nose. Get on my level. I'm Steve Buscemi. Come on. Um, but, yeah, I'm picking him. Come on. Even just uh, the two of those men present themselves to me, and there's no, there's no question I'm going with my boy Steve. Interesting. Hmm. I'm going to go with Steve Buscemi me as well on this one all right, all right I'll, t- I'll take tom holland um next one chris penn or sean penn who's chris penn he is also reservoir dogs guy um big guy sean penn's brother oh well yeah if he's just famous for being sean penn's brother then i'm just well, gonna he, pick sean he's penn. been he's a, a character actor who's been in a lot of google him look at his well, face I don't look at his face so i'm gonna yeah. pick sean penn yeah. But I'll yeah I'll look at his face. But I'm still I'm gonna pick Sean Penn. Yeah. Oh, that sure. Yeah. yeah, that guy. Um, I'm gonna go Sean Penn. I don't know. I don't know his brother. <laughs> I'll take Sean Penn too. Um, <clears throat> next one is Leonardo DiCaprio or Barack Obama. <laughs> As as much as um, I think Leonardo DiCaprio does have his his faults and his flaws, he's never ordered a drone strike. So I am gonna have to pick Leo for that reason. Just you know, fundamentally, like he has less blood on his hands yeah. than you know, Mr. Barack. Um, I, you know, he he was a you know, say what you want about politics and presidents. He he did a fine job, but you know, when it comes down to brass tacks. Leo has killed less, uh, you know, Middle Eastern children, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna go for Leo on this one. I always like hearing all of, like, the, I don't know conspiracy theories, but, like, all the rumors about his weird sex bubble that he has in his backyard. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, like, has to wear, he wears, like, sensory deprivation headphones, and he has this, like, weird bubble tent in his yard, and he only has sex, like, in this mm-hmm. weird bubble in his yard. It's uh, it's a rumor, but I would like to believe it's true, because it's funny. That's, like, I feel like Ooh, when you're just on, like, the highest, you're just on the highest dosage of antidepressants, so you need the sensory deprivation headphones to, like, keep you in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm gonna come this time, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I'll take Barack. <laughs> <laughs> Jen's like, that's gross. Barack. <laughs> uh, next one is Brad Pitt or Chris Pine? Um, uh, uh, Chris Pine. Uh, Chris Pine, uh, Brad Pitt could have, or I was just going to make another, uh, Chris Pine could have done any Brad Pitt movie, but Brad Pitt could never have done uh, uh, Princess Diaries too. But he probably he probably could. He so yeah, could have actually. Brad yeah, no, fine. Dara, he would have actually crushed that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. Fuck. <laughs> um, I oh, that's tough. Um, I love Chris Pine, but I think I'm gonna go for Brad Pitt on this one. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna take Brad Pitt too. Um, next one, Margot Robbie or Princess Peach. <laughs> <laughs> is she gonna be Prince? No. Um, so Anya Taylor Joy live action. Yeah, Anya Taylor Joy is gonna be Princess Peach in the in the upcoming live action Mario movie. Which why the fuck is that even okay. happening? But I'm still gonna see it because Jack Black is gonna be Bowser, I think, which is gonna be awesome. Who's gonna be Mario? Chris, uh, Chris Pratt. Ugh. Oh, Obviously, wow. yeah, yeah, gross. I really want to um, know if he's gonna do Mar- like the Italian accent or if he's just gonna like raw dog it with his like normal boring ass white person voice. Like you yeah, know what I mean? He, he's definitely he's definitely just gonna do play play the guy he always is, yeah. which is um, kind of unfortunate. I'm gonna say. Margot Robbie being live action Barbie is very close to Princess Peach. Um, so I guess, but I, yeah, I guess I'll go with Margot. Yeah. She's a real person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish um, filming hadn't wrapped on uh, the new Barbie movie already. So Trisha Paytas's baby could make a cameo considering that her <sighs> name is legally Malibu, Malibu Barbie. Barbie. I love it. Um, I'm gonna go for Margot, though, as well. I was never a Princess Peach, uh, girl in my youth. I never played as her on Mario Kart. I was usually Toad. You were Toad? I was also Toad. <laughs> Wahoo! <laughs> wah, wah, wah! <laughs> Margot Robbie for this week. Don't really... I was, I think I was any of them that would come in, like, the baby version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... yeah. 
Baby Rosalina? Why is there a baby Rosalina? Riddle me that. <laughs> um, Austin Butler or Elvis? So we w- just watched the Elvis movie last night um, as a family, and I it was harrowingly awful. Really? Uh, Oh yeah, I I think we all we all despised it the whole time. Um, he he did a fine job. Out of all the things that r- really rubbed me the wrong way about it, his performance was like pretty low on my mm-hmm. list. He was fine. How do you I, feel about Tom Hanks' you know, performance? Like, I've heard different things about that. Bad, bad, really bad, really mm. bad. Um, Cheesy and yeah, they weird just and you know bad. they made him wear like a prosthetic nose so that he could be Jewish, and it just was like. Not mm. good. I um, haven't seen it yet. But yeah, I guess I have to I have to pick Austin Butler because Elvis was never on iCarly, so <laughs> Yeah. This is tough because one Elvis um ripped off a lot of um black artists and sang their music and took all their money and everything like that. But at the same time there's that um that moment from it's like that live special he did where he goes and he says, Lord have mercy, and then he deep throats the microphone. <laughs> And that makes me giggle. That was pretty iconic. That makes me giggle a lot. Um, uh, I'll go for Austin Butler, though, I guess. I've never been, like, an Elvis girl, like, besides uh, listening to the Lilo and Stitch soundtrack, so. (laughs) The Gen Z version of being an Elvis girl is being a Lilo and Stitch girl. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll take Austin Butler for the sweep. Um, we decided sometime we could have a drinking game where if we sweep, everybody takes a shot. Yeah, Jen really wants to play a game where we all, like, <laughs> fill out, like, a worksheet version ahead of time so that there's no cheating, and then we read off of them, and if we all get the same thing, we have to take oh, a shot. Oh, we should do I that. I think I would get liver failure, but... <laughs> we should do that. Jen, maybe we can do that for, um, uh, next week. For the next one? Yeah. All right, um, I'm down. I'm totally down. Uh, next one is Dakota Fanning or Elle Fanning. Oh, uh, what? Oh, yeah. I was I was just gonna ask what Dakota Fanning was in, but she was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, she did um, a good job. Yeah, I'm gonna pick Dakota over Elle. I I like them both a lot, but um, I think Dakota Fanning has uh, some more iconic roles to me, like Twilight and um, I don't know, just like a lot of her child mm. acting stuff. I feel like she was very prevalent when we were growing up. I think Elle Fanning has um, more of an impact on my um, regular life now, which I appreciate more. Um, And she's just in some of my favorite movies and TV shows, and I think she's phenomenal. Um, If you haven't seen The Great, definitely go check it out, because that is one of my favorite shows on TV right now. Uh, So I'll I'll go for Elle. Um, I'm going to go for Elle, too. What... what, um streaming platform is the great uh, Hulu, Hulu, yeah. I believe. Hulu. Okay. It's really good. Right. Jenna, I think, I think I you'd think, like it a lot. I think I would like it. Yeah. I think I really would. Um, all right. Uh, next one is <clears throat> Luke Perry, R.I.P., or Katy Perry? Luke Perry. I Is it bad that I don't know who Luke Perry is? <laughs> oh, from uh, 90210. He played uh, Dylan. Um, Dylan McKay. Um, oh, he was in Riverdale. Nothing. He plays the dad Nothing. in Riverdale. I'll go for Katy Perry Still on nothing? this one. The and he died of a stroke at like the age of fifty. It was really that sad. is really sad. Teen, teen. Idol. That is really yeah. sad. But um, I'm just thinking about the impact that Katy Perry's song "E.T." had on me, and that's a, <laughs> and that's enough. <laughs> so I'll go for Katy Perry on this one. Okay, I, I'm gonna go for Luke Perry. Um, <clears throat> last one: Al Pacino or Bianca Del Rio. Bianca Del Rio. Bianca Del Rio, for those who don't know, Bianca Del Rio is the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race season six and perhaps the uh, most iconic winner of all time. And I think factually the the one who's made the most money, like doing, you know, I think for as far as uh, net worth, she really rakes it in with those comedy specials. So I have to say Bianca Del Rio because who is Al Pacino to me? No one. Who is Bianca Del Rio to me? Everything. <laughs> See, I don't know who Bianca Del Rio is. I always feel like like really bad as a queer person who like hasn't gotten like really involved in Drag Race. Like it's something that I need to like level up. You know what I mean? But like I haven't. I I will say, at this point though, it's, it's so like, much. It's like if you've never seen a Marvel movie and trying to exactly. go see, you there's know, so much like, content. Endgame. It's there's a lot going on. Yeah, you would. You really need to. To, you know, put well, in I need to take like a year to, off to go back need, and like learn all of. Them. I need to take a year off just to do this. <laughs> yes, 
Like, I go to, like, my, like... A sabbatical. Yeah, really. <laughs> I need to go... <laughs> Do you think I can submit that to work? Be like, hey, guys, so sorry. But for me, I need to take, like, a couple of weeks, like, maybe some months off, just so I can get caught up on Drag Race. Is that okay? Continuing Ed. <laughs> <laughs> a Trader, if any workplace is going to let you it's do it, it's going to be Trader Joe's. I mean, come on. Everyone's gay. They, they'd understand. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah. So for that reason, I'll go for Al Pacino, just because I can't um, unknowingly submit my answer. Right, I'm going to go with uh, Bianca Delrio. Um, and that is it for the second installment of Tarantino Chocolate or Vanilla. Stunning. Beautiful. Thank you so much, This is wonderful. <laughs> that was lovely. Um, and as always, we love you and we appreciate you. And goodbye. Yeah, I think I always choose a, a dialogue heavy movie mm-hmm. over an action heavy movie because yeah. I just think that that's more gratifying and more fun. And I love that this movie is definitely way more dialogue heavy. And I love yeah. that the final fight scene is hardly a fight at all. It's oh, just yeah. them like having a chat. It's him like making a sandwich and them having a chat. Yeah. And then like a few moments of like in between. And then like, oh, we're going to talk for another minute. And yeah. Just like chat it out. And then like, oh, another pew, pew, pew. And then, oh, wait, but wait, we need to chat mm-hmm. about this more. And and I think that that as like the final apex, this is her killing bill. Mm -hmm. And it's just them, like, having a conversation in a kitchen Mm -hmm. is way more interesting, especially because we already did that, get that grand choreographed fight scene in the first movie. I'm like, we don't need another one. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the most interesting way that you could have ended this movie. It's way more gratifying. Right, because then we are getting all the details and the complexities of their relationship, which you can tell makes her killing him so difficult for her because she does love him and they do have this sort Mm -hmm. of, like companionship and respect for each other but like she has to do it and he knows she has to do it Mm -hmm. um yeah it's just that makes it way more interesting to me than if they were gonna do the like you know shoot guns out sort of thing which like that's another thing like i really like there's this one scene at the end which is basically like the next morning after like she's taken bb like they're in like a hotel somewhere or whatever bb's watching cartoons and she's just sobbing holding like a teddy bear on the bathroom floor and i think and I, like as much as like that oh i i don't know it's just one of those scenes like you wouldn't have thought was like super necessary but it's incredibly necessary you know what i mean cuz again full spectrum of emotions on display there it's like shit bill's dead and it's like oh thank god bill's dead and it's like oh my god i actually did this i'm so relieved oh my god my baby's alive like it goes through like 10 different things in the span of like 10 seconds of just uma thurman crying which is just wonderful she's also like laughing she's yeah like, then she's like laughing but then she's also sobbing yeah absolutely brilliant because i think we get it's like the r's right the relief and the regret and yeah we see the her shock of seeing BB and like processing all of that so <laughs> fast, that emotion, and then just like the hard turn. She finally has a moment to actually process everything. Which I think you could so say that uh, an assassin revenge film does not need that. That she she gets all the people she needs to get, and it's like yeah, right off into the sunset, we did it, right? But it truthfully, her as a character, she is gonna feel like that yeah. conflict, especially at the yeah. end, like the big one at the end, um, mm-hmm. which I think is sort of the depth that you don't get from a lot. Like, this yeah. is so much more than, like, an action assassin movie. It's it's about mm-hmm. those, like, levels. Yeah. Um, especially, but. like, there's a lot of, like, more human scenes, I guess, in this one, because, again, it's all just killing in the first one, really, like, setting it up um and all that shit but like there's a couple of like interactions with different people that i'm like these feel like more like human interactions i guess and everything like that which like definitely with oh god what's his name it's like bill's father figure senor oh, fuck though he run he runs a brothel basically yeah and everything like that but um there's the one scene, and I always really liked it, when Beatrix, it's a flashback, she's, like, explaining to Bill, like, what happened and when she ran away and why she ran away. When she, like, um, finds out she's pregnant. And I really liked the standoff, because it's, like, her, like, in a hotel room, like, moments before, like, she finds out she's pregnant and an assassin comes to her door to kill her, because she's on a mission, she got spotted, blah, 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 there's a blowout. Um, and it's, like, this whole interaction of her being, like, please, will you just look at the pregnancy test on the ground? And it's just so interesting to, like, see, like, these two assassins, like, have it out and be, like, 
listen, I need, like, I know we're here to do a job and, like, we're machines in this way, but I need you to reel it back, be a human being for once, listen to me, and, like, look at that shit. And, like, I just really like seeing that scene, like, as she's, like, decided, she's, like, okay, I'll let her live. And she, like, goes and she, like, she's, like, walking out, like, gun still pointed at her, puts it down finally, and she says, congratulations, and then scurries away. But, like, that's, like, the mo- like one of the most human interactions you get in this entire movie, which I really like. that scene is always so jarring to me, because then you think back to the beginning of the first movie. So Beatrix essentially uses her pregnancy as a way to get out of getting murdered in this moment, and it successfully mm-hmm. works that this, you know, other assassin is like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I... Fine, I'll have a heart. Know, let's... Right? And then you go back to the beginning of volume one, and she fucking kills Vivica A. Fox. What's her name? Renita Green? Yeah. She... Copperhead? She kills Copperhead in front of her, like, six-year-old daughter. Like, literally knife to the heart in the kitchen in front of her actual child. Hey, I'll give it to her. Do you think she knew the child was there? No, no, no. Well, the child gets home off the bus, and they tell her to go to her room. Mm -hmm. But still, you're then killing a mom of a kid in the same house Mm -hmm. where she's there. And then there's the whole, you know, oh, if you're ever still feeling, you know, hung up about it, come find me, Mm -hmm. whatever thing. But I'm like, that's you used your unborn 20-minute-ago peed-on-a-stick fetus to get out of it. And yet you're going to knife in the heart. uh, Because she did what Beatrice wanted to do. She removed herself from the assassin life and had a kid and got a house in the suburbs Mm -hmm. and sort of like figured her shit out right she did so you should in theory have the respect for her Mm -hmm. that you should you know kind of put things into perspective but no knife to the heart which no because she's the whole movie you have to have the the levels and she was you know it was a fight yeah she was she was you know fighting back and protecting herself Mm -hmm. but i always every time i watch that scene of her using the pregnancy i'm like damn bitch you knifed a mother in the heart Nary two weeks ago. Well, like, at that point, she still thought of, she was like, "You took my ch- shot at this away." Yeah, I'm gonna fucking kill you. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, it's justified. Yeah. But I just think it's uh, like you know, comparatively yeah. kind of funny. I also really like that uh, that whole flashback scene, the pregnancy scene, um, because we get a slam poem at the end, um, <laughs> where she's like, "Before that strip." turn blue i would have turned my life upside down for you or some shit like that <laughs> and it's like this fucking like two stanza like slam poem that like uma thurman is like giving bill <laughs> i'm like hell yeah the sis <laughs> <laughs> go off he whips out his bamboo flute I love that flute so much. Dude, whenever I watch this movie, I'm like, I want to learn how to do that. (laughs) It's like, instead of being the guy who brings out the acoustic guitar at the fire, no. Pull a bill. Pull up the bamboo flute at the at the campfire. That's the kind of guy that you want to be. Dude, I'm trying (laughs) to... Oh my god. It's like, straight guitar guy at the party? No, I'm going to be the gay flute girl at the party. (laughs) <laughs> I'm making direct I, I'm making direct eye contact with the most beautiful girl in the room while I serenade her on my flute. <laughs> oh my goodness. I just keep I just keep looking at my notes and I just have an all caps squish the eyeball with her toes. <laughs> Ew! Oh, it's so Not gross. To go back to that, but it is just so, and that's the sound effect they use for that. The like, yeah, I so hate it. Oh, uh, it's so nasty, dude. It's so fucking nasty. Um, one thing that like uh, popped out to me more this time around, and I don't know if it's just like I never noticed it or if it was though it just because it's on HBO. The aspect ratio um, of when she's like tied up in the truck. I never realized, like, the, like, and obviously there's a lot of, like, visual, um, not editing, but, like, techniques used. It's, like, the black and white and everything like that, and, like, the side shot of her, like, tunneling up through the ground and everything like that. I, lo- I love the camera work, um, in this movie a lot, but I never realized the aspect ratio change, like, when she's tied up in the truck, because it's, like, it's, like, one-to-one or something like that, um... Like, a full square. Oh. Yeah, no, I never realized. And then, like, what... Because what, it's, it's, like, her, like, figuring out she's tied up in a truck, basically. And, like, as soon as he pulls her out, it's, like, full back to, like, um, a regular... I don't know what a regular aspect ratio is. I'm bad movie. I also... 
podcaster. Yeah, I also never um, noticed that. Yeah. I did just know that the scene of her digging up through the dirt is really giving um, Fantastic Mr. Fox. You know that one scene in Fantastic Mr. Fox where they're all like tunneling yeah. upwards? <laughs> Literally, I was watching this with my friend Rachel. She's like, this is like that movie. And couldn't have been more vague. And I'm like, Fantastic Mr. Fox? And she was like, yes. Like, how did you? How but did you know? It's just... How did you know? Upwards. But typically, use of black and white, I find to be pretentious, annoying, mm. and just, like, unnecessary. Mm. For the most part, in movies that are entirely black and white, I'm usually like, fuck off, right? Yeah. Like, like, fuck off, fuck out of you here. You try to be artsy. It really is... It's rarely giving me what I, I, you know, what they're trying to do with it. I'm just like, mm-hmm. ah, just, this is stupid to me. And the use of like, oh, this one scene is going to be in black and white. I'm usually annoyed by it. This movie, obviously, I'm not annoyed by it. I think it's really yeah. good and useful and I enjoy it a lot. And especially to differentiate like timeline sort of thing. Like it's all always the the black and white scenes are the, you know, that specific mm-hmm. um, like flashback sort of thing. And then when we get the black and white, we're only the, the sword is in color, and then only the car is in color. Mm-hmm. Like, that very last um, car sequence of her driving mm-hmm. up, I think, is also really fucking cool. Um, pretty recently, something that similarly did that was um, the the last season. Well, I think they did it with all the seasons, but particularly the last season of Better Call Saul mm. re- really utilized some, like, black and white, um, like, moments to differentiate timeline stuff that I'm like, oh, I want to hate this, but I fucking love it. <laughs> like, it's just Hell so yeah. like, I want to be annoyed. <laughs> Do we want to get into our regularly scheduled programming? Yes. Sick. What do we usually do first? Fuck, Mary kill. Mm-hmm. Do we think that objectively is it... I think it's the, the Vipers. The bride. The, the, or is it, is it Bill or is I it think it's Beatrix? Bud. Wait, uh, well, Bud, Bud, L, and then Beatrix or Bud, L, and Bill? Let's do Bill because it's more interesting. Because I think like we okay. would all like marry Beatrix true yeah bud l and bill i think i'm going to i'm gonna marry l because Mm -hmm. as much as bill has that nice house he seems like problematic and also i don't really want to deal with that kid like she seems nice Mm -hmm. and everything but just it's not for me uh, so I'm going to marry Elle because I'm sure she's off doing some sort of lavish assassin lifestyle type stuff that I could probably get behind. I'm going to fuck Bill because he's got to be swinging something because that is an old man who is pulling objectively like one of the most beautiful women alive. Uh-huh. Um, so there's got to be a little something, something going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I'll just kill Bud because he Bud. is unsanitary. He's, He's gonna unsanitary. Give me a UTI. <laughs> He's gonna give you a lot of things. Um, I'm, I'm also gonna kill Bud because what, what's there for me? Nothing. There's nothing I want there. Um, oh man, I think I'm gonna fuck L because she seems so high maintenance that I could not marry her. I couldn't do it. She's a lot. She scares me. Like, if I piss her off, she's gonna, like, cut off one of my fingers. You know what I mean? Like, at least Bill seems, like, a little more level-headed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is interesting to say, considering that he fucking shot up Beatrix's wedding. Um, But I think him and I could vibe. I think we could vibe. He may he he's got a lovely house. He can house. get you a flute. Yeah, he'd teach me how to play the flute. Oh my god, I'd be so I'd be so happy. Um, I don't know. Like I don't fuck with kids. Like that is the thing. Like, BB's cute, well, but Beatrix she's not for can me. Take, maybe you can be a a moderator, and you can like let you know. Beatrix can take BB and go, and then you and Bill can just yeah vibe off to yeah. the side. He can tell me, like, listen, the way he was talking to Beatrix in, like, one of those flashback scenes, talking about Pi May, it's like he was telling a child a bedtime story, which I did not love. But, like, if he needs me to, like, stand in while he, like, gets used to his daughter being gone, that's fine. I'll listen to him, r- him ramble, and then we'll play the flute. <laughs> then we'll drink some... We can watch some videos. Yeah. <laughs> Shogun Assassin. And we'll drink some, we'll drink some like, really good tequila, because it seems like he has really good tequila. BB is gonna have to go to so much therapy. I love it. 
I love that shit. She was eating it up. And I love that Beatrix was like, hell yeah, this is exactly what I would have shown her. Yeah. Nice. Um, um, and then, I don't, I mean, I guess moving to the whole movie, it's not really too much different other than I think obviously I'm going to marry Beatrix. Yeah. I'm going to kill Bud's boss at the strip club <laughs> because he was just a dick. Yeah. Um, and then I'll fuck... I'll fuck the assassin who, the, the pro-life assassin who does not kill Beatrix because she's pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna, obviously, yeah, I'm gonna marry um, Beatrix. I'm gonna fuck, see, I can't find his name. Um, it's like Bill's father figure. He's like 80 years yeah. old and he runs a brothel. I just know that guy pipes. <laughs> Fair. Fair. Um, also, I love his little like cigarette holder. He's like chewing. He's like gnawing on the whole time. I'm like, mm, okay. Um, and then I'm going to kill BB. <laughs> <laughs> Get her out of the picture. <laughs> oh my god. I'm saying I'm dude, at that point I'm just saving Beatrix money for the therapy. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say she can't pay for them both to go to like good therapy, so I'd rather her have a good therapy. Which also like as much as like she's like, I can I I, I can tr- uh um uh, raise that child better, I'm like, how? Where do we go from here? <laughs> Where do we go from here? Come on. Because like, like yeah. Bill was saying, he's like, you can't live a normal life. Like, you can't yeah. you can't be Clark Kent, dude. You're a stone-cold killer, and you liked killing everyone that you got, like, your sword on this entire time. And she was like, yeah, it kind of got my rocks off. Um, so, well, like... I feel like that's only because she had the, like, the justification, like, to just be an assassin and just be paid, like, oh, here's... X amount of money to go kill this person. That's way less gratifying than like this person wronged me and I'm gonna fuck them up. True like enough. that. Um, I feel like you know who who is there left for her to kill that will be that gratifying. I totally think that she can. His Superman speech. I'm like, yeah, that's valid, but also like once she kills you, she's free. Yeah, true enough. Um, but as far as what would you eat and drink with this film? So. I'm going to tell you what I drank, because I just really liked it. Um, nothing to do with the movie, really. Don't care. I just thought it was really good. Um, I made, like, a rosemary and blue... It's, it's like a blueberry, lemon, rosemary, like, spritzer, um, basically. Um, and which you can easily make this, like, without alcohol. I did it with, um, like, zero-proof uh, tequila, because as much as we love a good drink on this podcast, sometimes it's good to be conscious about um, your consumption. <laughs> so I it's I made like a blueberry simple syrup, which I'd never done before. It's wonderful. Dara, I know you're a big simple syrup guy. Um, oh, yeah. Huge simple syrup guy. So I did that. Um, just some uh, like half of a lemon, some seltzer, tequila, no tequila, alcohol free tequila, and then, like, you smack the shit out of some rosemary so it gets all nice and, like, um, uh, not scented. Fragrant. Fragrant, yes, thank you. Um, yeah. Put that in there. Beautiful color. So good. Just fucking delicious. Um, so I'm going to say you drink that um, just because I thought it was really good. And also, um, if you're going to do something like a drink, it's going to be tequila-based. Bill is fucking ripping shots when Beatrix gets to his house. So I'm like, hell yeah. Um... And to eat, see, I made myself tacos, but I'm not gonna say you make tacos. I just didn't have like a lot of em- uh, like effort. It was like ten o'clock. Um, I think you could like make like an empanada or something like that. I think that'd be really hot, or like a tamale. Like I'm definitely leaning into the fact that he's like somewhere in Mexico, kind of thing. Which is all, and like also like this movie takes place like sort of um, like on like the U.S. border, like down like south by Mexico and everything like that. Like lean into that. Do like some like some half-assed American type of like Spanish food if you want. 
go really authentic. Something nachos. Yeah, nachos, whatever. Um, do whatever you feel. But I, I'd say I'd say go for like an empanada. I think that'd be hot. I like that, especially because it is a tequila-heavy movie, yes. not only because of Bill, but because Bud also makes those sloppy-looking margaritas, mm. which, like, as disgusting as his kitchen is and how nasty Would you that drink is one? he's pouring it, I'm like... I'm like, damn, I kind of I kind of do want one right mm-hmm. now. I'm like, fuck. And I think there are very few um, like other, you know, foods that can go well with a tequila drink because my food suggestion, I originally was like, oh, okay, so you do the margarita, right? Because this movie does, I'm like, mm, I want a margarita now, right? Yeah. But so my food, my original food suggestion was that the, the first part is based off of a Kung Fu movie yeah. and the second part is Western. based off of a spaghetti Western, a spaghetti Western. So you eat spaghetti right? That could be kind of fierce, but spaghetti and a margarita, I cannot think of a more just uncompatible combination. Mm. So that's like a no. Um, But you know, if you want to do spaghetti, I think that that would be really cute and silly to to eat spaghetti with this. And then I don't know, whatever goes well with spaghetti, just like white wine or whatever. Um, But what I did eat in real life, I found to be just incredibly random and odd. It wasn't until moments before this podcast where you were like i wouldn't just say a ham and cheese sandwich because that's what he makes bb he makes our ham and cheese Uh and he cuts the crust off is that the thing that i ate is so perfectly an elevated ham and cheese because i watched this at my friend rachel's apartment and rachel was like oh like do you want lunch i just have a bunch of this random shit i'm just gonna make us like an amalgamation i was like yeah go for it so it was chicken cordon bleu oh my god it was just like the kind that come in the freezer, but you could, which honestly was pretty fire, was but you, you could still, you could get as fancy with it as you want. And we just had like a bunch of other random shit with it as well. Ooh. We were drinking chai teas. It was just like the Ooh. most random combination of food. But a chicken cordon bleu is like the elevated classy version of a ham, of a ham sandwich because it's a ham, it's ham and Swiss inside a, a chicken breast. So in a roundabout way, I do think what I ate was very relevant. And that's what I'm going to tell you like is that. to have a chicken cordon bleu. And then I don't really know if tequila does or doesn't go with that, but I don't know. Drink drink whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Drink one of those lemon blueberry spritzers. That sounds fucking It was really good. Uh, it was delicious. really good. I cannot outdo you for this this one. I also love, if you, if you don't know this, any sort of herb you have, you have to snack it to like activate it. And I never knew that until Henry, we were making mojitos. He's like, you got to snack the mint. I'm like, why? And he's like, it's, it's been not a bad gonna girl. Get minty until you smack it. <laughs> it's like it's not gonna get minty until you smack it. I'm like, shit, okay. But now, whenever you know, you make a drink and you have mint or rosemary or whatever, you gotta, yeah. Which is really I love great. it. Um, and a, a fun little uh-huh. drama. We love we have theatrics. And then, what would you follow this up with? I'm just because it's relevant right now, um, and because while I was watching this movie, and because I'm. Um, a piece of shit that can't stay off her phone for more than like 30 minutes at a time. I just ended up watching, it came across my feed, um, Maya Hawk doing ASMR, um, promoting her new movie, um, Do Revenge. So I think you do, you do, because I don't know that Maya Hawk's done like a full like feature length movie yet or not. I don't know, but, like, I know this is definitely, like, one that's been, like, promoted heavily, and it's, like, doing its circuits on Netflix, and I've heard it's got, like, really good reviews. I saw, like, 92% on Rotten Tomatoes or something like that. So, I'm gonna say you do the mother-to-daughter jump, and you go watch Maya Hawke's new movie, Do Revenge, because it looks fun and fresh, and I'm not sure that there's murder or not in it, but it is a revenge movie. This is a revenge film. You do that, and I think it looks silly and goofy and, like, a little less serious, not just a little, a less serious than this. It just seems like a fun jump. And also, I love Maya Hawk. I want to be in this family. Well, Emily, you dumb fucking bitch, you stole my follow-up eh. because I also said that you make the effortless and seamless transition a movie about motherhood, because I, obviously, you watch volume one and yeah. volume two. I love doing these back-to-back, but as far as, you know, post-volume two, where do we go? It's a it's a motherhood yeah. film. You you watch something her daughters in. I also haven't seen it yet, but no. I thought that that would be. It a, came out like yesterday. Jump. But so. thankfully, I have a backup. Mm-hmm. So okay. <laughs> if so, if you um, don't want to do that, another movie that I just straight up haven't seen that okay. I'm going to um, recommend to you is that 
they released volumes one and two six months apart from each other because they filmed them all at the same time and they were intended to be, you know, one film. And so they just did it. And so I'm going to say that another prequel sequel thing that is coming out it's going to be a trilogy but that's coming out in pretty rapid Stop succession it. because Stop it's it. being because it's it was um sort of concepted <gasps> as such as you go see yeah the um the new the prequel to x i i really enjoyed x as like a fun slasher but like a24 good i, I really liked it and pearl just came out uh a couple of days ago so i'm really excited to go see that and i love sort of that idea of like we planned this to be a fully fleshed out story before we even like released mm-hmm. the first movie because I hate when a sequel or a prequel feels like a oh this movie did well enough and now this is an afterthought like a cash grab thing no like this these movies are all coming out I think X did not come out that long ago like what like a year or two like I don't know less than a year ago it, honestly but it's not a it's not a reactionary prequel it's a planned mm-hmm. out this is a you know and I just appreciate that from like a storytelling perspective that this was, I don't know, this was the point to begin with, mm-hmm. and it's not just, like, a, a thing. So, much like Kill Bill Volumes yeah. 1 and 2 go together, Pearl yeah. goes with X in the same way that they were sort of concepted together. So, I'm excited to go see it. Yeah. I, I haven't, yeah. um, obviously haven't seen it yet, but <clears throat> recommended two movies we haven't I like seen. It. So, I like it. Uh, fucking- I'm also gonna, gonna say that instead of watching a movie, you just go and you sit down for 30 minutes and you try and manifest um, a Kill Bill Volume 3 with Maya Hawk. <laughs> I, yeah that is another one that i'm like do we really need it I, we Probably don't need it but i want it would, would i go see it would i go see it oh yes. my god i like, want it maya hawk if you're listening first of all come be on our podcast second of all honey what's going on <laughs> go talk to uncle quentin I could understand though <laughs> I could understand maybe why they wouldn't like no, I I totally know, get from it. the trauma of No, I I totally we'll, get it. I totally we'll get see. it. It's it has been like a rumored to be in It's the, just one of those things. It's like in the It's air. like one of those things like if she didn't like have a daughter that would or, like her own daughter that Slay. looks just like her would do it so fucking well and like like if those do, if it didn't line up like that, I couldn't care less. But like the idea of like her like doing that and being that role, I'm like, fuck. I'm like, I don't know. Kind of kill and kind of slay. Right. Okay, this is my. I want it, but I want Uma Thurman to direct it. But so to wrap things up, what would you rate this movie? I I totally forget what I even said for the I first one. Probably an eight, just because I think together. I think they are the same to me. I saw a good comment on Letterboxd where someone said, trying to make me choose a favorite between part volumes one and two is like, ask me to pick a favorite ass cheek. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I love that, right? It's because so right. They're just like, it's so true. They are harmoniously one and the same. So yeah, I think I, I'm going to guess that I said like an, an eight and I'm going to give it an eight. Interesting. Uh, Because it is one of my favorite movies. I love it. But I do think you have to, like, recognize its faults and hold uh, creators accountable for being shitty fucking people. Even though I love to watch this movie, it always just put a sour taste in my mouth that I'm like, ah, what a bummer that this great movie is made by a bunch of fucking pieces of shit, huh? Um, But then, obviously, that's made up for by Uma Thurman just being, like, an amazing, uh, shining light beacon Mm -hmm. of a human being. So, yeah, I'm going to give it a solid. I'm going to give it a nine and a half. I really love this movie. It's one of those things, and especially because, like, I remember watching these. Derry, you showed me it for the first time. I didn't like it the first time I watched it, but then I watched it again, and I watched this one. And it just really, this is, like, one of those things, those movies that, like, really kicked off, like, me loving movies, which I'm sure, like, plenty of people can say, like, a Tarantino movie is the thing that did it for them. Um... But, so I feel like I've just got a lot of history with this movie. I really like it. Um, It's been a long time since I've watched this one. Probably, like, four plus, five plus years, honestly. Um, I just think it's spectacular. It's always a joy to watch, so. Nine and a half. You probably didn't enjoy it the first time because I wasn't even watching the movie. I was watching you watch the movie. And I was like, what, you don't like it? What, you don't like it? <laughs> I'm sure I was, like, actively bullying you and being like, so so what do you think? What do you yeah. think? What do you think uh-huh. now? What, what do you uh-huh. think? What well, it was think? just one of those things, like, I had never seen a movie like that before. I, like, it was genuinely. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, it was very we were like 13 years old, and like Kill Bill being like one of those first movies that like are like a movie that like your parents don't show you that's like critically acclaimed and like an amazing movie. It's definitely jarring, but like I'm so glad like these are like the things that kicked off. Like, oh god, I really like this. And then I guess just to wrap things up, this has been Sequel September. Hold on to your fucking horses for next week. <laughs> Don't get ready. We're pulling out the big guns, pulling out the big guns once again. Um, and as always, just you know, ending the show with our general commentary of please, please slide into our DMs with movie suggestions, theme suggestions, chocolate or vanillas, all of it. We fucking love to hear from you. And even if you don't have a suggestion, just come say hi, and we will say hi back. We love chatting with all of you. You're also fucking cool. I cannot believe that actual people listen to us just like spew bullshit um and that you you know find us entertaining enough to listen for an hour every week y'all fucking rock so hard um and yeah we have this out on youtube now so it's a little less uh i I edit the audio to sound not (laughs) shitty and i don't have that capability with video just because it's like so long i I don't know but so the youtube is a little less formal there's a little we have we have technical difficulties we have awkward pauses but if you want to see our beautiful shining faces here on this saturday morning um you can go check out our youtube channel subscribe uh description in the link below and then also our merch if you want to check that shit out we just have some like stupid sweatshirts stickers all that good stuff even if you don't want to buy anything just you know click on links it promotes our shit um and we love you all we appreciate you and goodbye and good night